Welcome to this bonus episode of The Impact, Coronavirus and Organised Crime from the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organised Crime. I'm Jack Megan Vickers. A few weeks ago we released a two-part special on Covid and corruption and one of my guests was Sarah Chayers, a journalist and author of Thieves of State and the upcoming book on corruption in America. I found it such an interesting interview that I wanted to share with you an extended version. So here it is. Enjoy. So Sarah, thanks for joining me on the podcast. If we can start off, first of all, could you give us an outline of your background, perhaps starting with your previous role as a journalist? I was a foreign correspondent for National Public Radio went in a crisis like every it's all hands on deck and so i went to cover the fall of the taliban in late 2001 i arrived in pakistan in october and covered the fall of the taliban and was reporting from kandahar which was their actual stronghold it was really their capital not kabul across into early 2002 at which point i decided you know it was time to shut up already and do something so i stayed behind to try to lend a hand in sort of reconstruction efforts. And I started a small cooperative that produced skincare products from licit local agriculture, which employed about at its height 20 Afghan men and women. But I was living in downtown Kandahar, you know, watching kind of the insurgency reignite all around me, all around us. I mean, it was the heart, really of where the Taliban regained a foothold in Afghanistan. And so from that vantage point, I started helping military units, including, it was more in the beginning, UK, Canada, Netherlands, which were posted in the South. So I'd help train up incoming headquarters elements and then ended up working for the US military at an increasingly high level and trying to make the point that corruption was driving this conflict. This was not some kind of fanatic religious ideology out of the sky. It was an extreme reaction to the systemic corruption that was crystallizing within and around the Afghan government with the apparent okay and even reinforcement of the U.S. and Western interveners. And so I tried to make that point not very successfully, ended up working for the chief of defense, the U.S. chief of defense, which is, you know, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. So that was interesting where my life, you know, would rocket back and forth from the D-ring of the Pentagon, (laughs) you know, to downtown Kandahar, Afghanistan. And I also worked on the Arab Spring for Admiral Mullen, who was the chairman at the time. And then I started trying to apply the lessons that I learned in Afghanistan more broadly and wrote Thieves of State and then spent several years studying and analyzing the structure and operating principles, if you will, of kleptocratic networks worldwide, because I came to understand that the phenomenon, the structured corruption that I had watched crystallize and come to understand a lot of its functioning in Afghanistan, that was not an Afghan aberration, which I had thought initially that it was. Rather, I found the very same principles applying to countries as diverse as Nigeria, Uzbekistan, Honduras, Serbia. And so I spent several years trying to understand the basic template for these structures. And for the last two years, I've been applying that very same template, which I developed looking at, if you will, developing countries or third world countries or countries of the global south. I've been applying that very same template to the United States. Given that and all your studies of corruption across the world, One thing I've gathered from speaking to people on various aspects of corruption is that people have different ideas about what corruption actually is. I wonder if you could explain what corruption means to you. It's a really important question, as as boring as definitions can sometimes be. 
This is a very important question. And what I will say, it's very interesting to see corruption being narrowed down, the sort of legal and practical definition of corruption, even among anti-corruption professionals, is narrowed down to a set of often very technical violations. Under U.S. law, those violations themselves are being narrowed and narrowed and narrowed to the point where, you know, I've had an anti-corruption prosecutor tell me it's no fun prosecuting these cases anymore because only bad criminals can be caught. And what he meant by that was people who are very poor at being corrupt are the only ones you're really able to prosecute anymore. The way I understand corruption is not so much a specific venal act of direct self-dealing by an individual official, but rather it's the operating system of increasingly sophisticated networks that weave together individuals in not just the public sector, but weave them together with private sector, you know, business people, and in most countries, without and out what you would call organized criminals. And so these are strands that weave together into an integrated network or a variety of networks. In different countries, these networks are more turbulent. They're beset by more rivalry than in other countries. In some countries, it's very tightly structured and controlled. In others, it's a bit more chaotic. But they are networks that are woven together through the exchange of personnel and the exchange of favors among personnel who may be at a given time situated in one or the other of the strands. That is to say, may be situated in the private sector or in the nonprofit sector, or in the criminal sector, or exercising government function. And the members of these networks who are situated in government, their job is to retool, repurpose, bend the agencies and institutions that are in their grasp, you know, where they hold their office, to serve the purposes of the network rather than serving the stated purpose of the public interest. And those agencies that they're unable to repurpose and weaponize in these ways, well, they simply defang them. They simply, you know, hollow them out or, or spike them, if you will, thinking of it like machinery. And you see this by you know, agencies that are underfunded, understaffed, where the capable staff is moved to very low level jobs. Often these agencies will be staffed, in fact, by people from the industries that they are meant to oversee in order to deprive them of effective power on behalf of the people. What examples have you seen around the world of corrupt networks like the ones you've just described? Oh, everywhere I've looked. I mean, in Afghanistan, it was absolutely clear, you know, where you even had single individuals. I can give you the brother of President Karzai, for example, who was simultaneously a member of provincial government, a heavy influencer on how national government performed owned by proxy various reconstruction companies that received the bulk of or a significant portion of reconstruction money and was also basically running the opium traffic in southern Afghanistan. So he himself was a node connecting all three of these strands within the Afghan networks. You see it in Honduras with the president of Honduras and his wife, his wife ran or runs, you know, a major nonprofit, supposed nonprofit foundation into which a lot of donations go, which are then doled out to supporters of the president. And then his brother, you know, was quite involved in the cocaine traffic. Same with the son of the previous Honduran president. When the current president was the president of Congress, he rushed through the complete stacking of the Supreme Court so that once he became president, he could then get the Constitution changed to allow for a second term, which he did. He then effectively stole the election for second term. And then a lot of government connected industries 
receive sweetheart contracts for everything from renewable energy to renewable energy is a very big one to health department purchases of supplies and whatnot. So that's kind of how it is organized. A whole range of sweetheart contracts were awarded to a closely knit network of, as I say, quote, renewable energy people, meaning hydroelectric dams in particular, palm oil plantations that are very destructive of the environment. We're in fact getting special beneficial contracts that are allocated for renewable energy, things like that. And then meanwhile, there are current and former military personnel who assassinate environmental defenders protesting these contracts in particular for hydroelectric dams. So these networks always have at their disposal both formal and informal instruments of force. And the informal instruments of force is one of the places they often intersect with organized crime. So they use retired personnel or other thugs. And then, of course, they intersect with organized crime in lucrative, illegal traffic, both in narcotics and often in consumer products that are smuggled to avoid customs tariffs. So you often have smugglers and the customs agency working hand in hand. That's very much the case in Afghanistan. And it's also been the case in many Central and Eastern European and Central Asian countries. One thing I wanted to ask was that I've seen written in various articles that are discussing corruption in the US, the term revolving door is used. Can you explain what's meant by that? Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, I don't like to use the the term revolving door. That is the standard term for this phenomenon in the United States. But I actually think it's misleading because revolving door focuses on the individual as though the individual is pushing the door between the public sector. They will have worked, for example, in the Pentagon doing military procurement for a number of years. And then they push that revolving door to go off and work in a defense contracting company whose main contracts are with the very same agency that that individual worked for in the Pentagon. So that individual has all these contacts and everything inside the the Pentagon. And the point is that in hopes of obtaining that employment, he or she cuts deals when he or she is in the Pentagon cuts deals that are very beneficial to the company rather than being particularly beneficial to American taxpayers because the individual is looking forward to the great high paying job she can get in the contractor. But I don't see it as the work of an individual. I see this as the operating system of the networks, which systematically place their members first in private sector, then in public sector, then in private sector, you know, keep this exchange of personnel as the way of, I want to say, weaving this network into a very dense fabric that serves itself rather than serving the public. The other incredibly breathtaking example that I hope we'll speak about with respect to COVID is the Treasury Department and various Wall Street firms, be they investment banks like Goldman Sachs or JP Morgan, or be they money managers like BlackRock or State Street. And that fabric is so dense that you can basically say, as far as I'm concerned, Wall Street has completely captured all of the financial or economic focused I want to say, agencies and personnel of the U.S. Treasury, of the Federal Reserve System, and of the important regulatory agencies. They are all staffed by people whose fundamental careers are on Wall Street. All of the contracts being signed are favorable to Wall Street firms and not to the American public. And none of the constraints that have been attempted to be placed on this industry by Congress since the 2008 meltdown have really had any teeth. And that brings us nicely on to actually talking about COVID. 
Have we seen examples of how these networks that you describe have used this current health crisis to actually steer public money into the networks? So what I've found around the world is that these networks are extremely effective at identifying potential major revenue streams. So if you analyze the networks in different countries, you'll see that they focus in on different revenue streams depending on, you know, the geographic and topographic uh, realities of the country or the geostrategic realities or whatever. I mean, just as a, as a small example, in Tunisia, which does not have fossil fuels, one of the remarkable little revenue streams captured by the Ben Ali network before the 2011 revolution was dates, the fruit, because those are quite valuable. They are sold, very high quality dates are sold to rich families in the Gulf for breaking Ramadan fast, right? So that was captured by the Bin Ali network. In many developing countries, development spending by countries in the global north is a very important revenue stream that gets captured. Well, here we are in a global pandemic that is requiring emergency, if you will, development money. That's really what's happening in the United States. And lo and behold, the network, which is located largely on Wall Street and in Treasury and among vulture investors, usually in the real estate derivative industry, the investors that buy up large quantities of, quote, distressed real estate and then securitize the mortgages into mortgage-backed securities of various types, that industry has a large presence in the Trump administration. And so if you look at the COVID relief package, there was an act of Congress called the CARES Act, which set aside nearly half a trillion dollars for Treasury to spend backstopping, and this is very important, backstopping purchases to be made by the U.S. Central Bank called the Federal Reserve in stock market securities. Now, these are, for the moment, not equities. For the moment, as far as I can tell, what's being purchased are bonds but they are corporate bonds and they include very risky corporate bonds such as commercial mortgage-backed securities. So these are the types of derivatives that not only generated the financial meltdown of 2008, but also create an incentive structure for large real estate investors to, number one, foreclose on homeowners, Number two, do predatory renting behavior such as losing people's rent checks and then charging them large late fees when the rent check was in fact sent, writing contracts whereby former owners have to rent their own former property from which they've been evicted at astronomical prices, taking on for themselves the responsibility to do all maintenance on the property without gaining any equity. I mean, this type of really predatory behavior for which companies belonging to Jared Kushner and Steven Mnuchin and other Trump administration members and friends, but also Democrats, for which their companies have had to settle court cases. Okay, so this type of flagrantly illegal practice is incentivized by the market for mortgage-backed securities. So the CARES Act sets aside half a trillion U.S. dollars of money to backstop further purchases by the Federal Reserve of such securities. What does the Federal Reserve purchase those securities with? With government-created money. You don't need to print it anymore. The Federal Reserve simply adds numerals to electronic ledgers. So it's electronic printed money. So the Federal Reserve is printing hundreds of billions of dollars, which it is deciding through a private company called BlackRock, which is one of these Wall Street money managers, to purchase 
corporate mortgage-backed securities, among other corporate bonds. That is fueling financial speculation. It's fueling what looks like a great stock market at a moment when the American economy is essentially crashed. So on one level, you can say, okay, it's good to keep liquidity in the market. But we now have a total disconnect between a stock market that is delivering outsized returns to major investors who are basically members of the kleptocratic network, while American citizens are being or about to be evicted from their homes because they, unemployed, are unable to pay their rents. That is the disconnect. That is where the kleptocratic network, in my view, corruptly captures public monies to put in its own pockets at the expense of the citizens. And what's really interesting is that the Federal Reserve is conducting these transactions through exactly the type of shell company secrecy jurisdiction that organized crime and corrupt officials utilize all around the world. So what has the Federal Reserve done? It's created an LLC or several LLCs, but one of them, meaning Limited Liability Corporation, in the state of Delaware. You know, this is the New York Fed, which is located in Manhattan, which chooses the secrecy jurisdiction Delaware, in which to incorporate a secret LLC whose operating agreement and, you know, and signatories are secret, which has contracted with BlackRock in a contract, some of whose elements are public, but some are not public. And it was a no-bid contract. I mean, that is exactly the type of behavior that a foreign kleptocrat or an organized crime syndicate would display. And just going on from that, with these networks, you mentioned that some government institutions are actually involved in this. So if their objective is not to govern, What are they trying to achieve by this type of behavior? Their objective is to maximize monetary returns for network members. Now, sometimes that's immediate, but too often, in my view, focus on corruption looks for immediate transactional self-dealing and quid pro quo. And there's a lot of that in the current U.S. administration. But very often these favors, which are monetary favors, but they are on a time release sort of thing. To think that corruption takes place via money in envelopes anymore is, again, to use the words of my prosecutor friend, to assume that corrupt officials are really terrible criminals. They're really bad at being criminals. They're much more sophisticated than that. So the objective is monetary return, but that monetary return may be later and in disguised forms, or it may have already taken place in the past. And the reason I'm pretty sure that it's about monetary return and not power for the sake of power has to do with something, a more deep cultural transformation that's been taking place around the world since about 1980 which I discuss a lot in my forthcoming book on corruption in America. And it really has to do with the social significance of money. I think that it's fair to say that after World War II, for a few decades, money had ceased to hold the exclusive role of cultural status marker that it held in the late 19th and early 20th centuries where a person's social status really was almost exclusively measured by how much money they had in their bank account. For a few decades following World War II, there was a change of ethos, and other social values were promoted and applauded as markers of a person's standing. In fact, it was often seen as untoward or gauche, if you will, or otherwise uncool to be displaying one's wealth in a very ostentatious way. That started to change around 1980. And a number of social you know, influencers, if you will, took the lead. The film industry sometimes inadvertently pushed this new ostentatious display of wealth as a as a mark of social standing. And I also think the collapse of the Soviet Union had a lot to do with it. 
And now, frankly, money is the measure. That's it. And that has placed our elites all around the world in a race with no finish line. Because, you know, Jack, if you have $23 million in your bank account, you know, and I sit at the desk next to you, well, I have to have 24, you know? And then that means you have to one-up me. And you see the results of this in the ridiculous race to get onto, you know, Fortune 500's billionaires list. And you find that a number of the people on that list have been outright lying about their bank accounts, including President Trump, including Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross, and I'm sure a number of others. And the problem with this, with this race with no finish line is although that money is invisible, it's electronic signals and bank accounts, it does all trace back to eventually to the real economy. And therefore, it is predicated on the destruction of our landscapes, in particular by fossil fuel and mineral companies, but not exclusively. I mean, even our cell phones require the destruction of our landscapes, I mean, which is finite, right? I mean, our our natural world is under acute stress at the moment, not just from CO2, but from a lot of the other type of devastation that is required to produce these zeros in these bank accounts. And it also requires the exploitation of workers, of homeowners and renters and, and borrowers, you know, Zeros in bank accounts are not, in fact, manufactured out of thin air, except if you're the Federal Reserve. Everybody else has to acquire them when you get into large numbers of them. They can you can only make a billion dollars by rigging the rules and exploiting people and landscapes. And so that is the disastrous spiral that today's pandemic of kleptocracy has thrust us into. And in the context of COVID, it is causing death because it also has led to premature, quote, reopening of economies. It has caused a kleptocratic extraction of excess profits from healthcare providers and materiel. It has led to the hollowing out of public health systems around the world. That's exactly what kleptocrats do. They cannibalize those agencies that are really meant to serve the public. You know, the ones they can't weaponize, they cripple and often cannibalize as they're crippling and health systems the world over are a prime target. And that's the case in, you know, developed countries facing COVID. And they have made a human sacrifice of health care and elder care personnel, not to mention patients. Now, you've touched on this in a couple of your previous answers, but how do these networks take control of a country? And then I imagine when they got control, it's about maintaining and exploiting that position. How do they get to that point? It's a great question. I think in many countries, there is, even countries that label themselves democracies, there is a natural tendency for wealthier people to have more access to public office. And then once there, they begin bending the rules to further favor the access to public office to wealthy people. But there are also counter moves that they unleash against what you could call the sort of egalitarian coalition that may be trying to rein them in. And those counter moves, the most frequently used one that I have seen currently is instrumentalizing identity divides. And that means, you know, sectarian divides in countries like Lebanon or or Iraq. It means ethnic divides in places like Bosnia or some African countries. In the United States and much of Europe, it means a kind of urban, rural, cultural divide, which is increasingly mapping onto our political divides. And those identity divides obtain a kind of visceral affiliation by people. And there's been a lot of sociological work showing how 
you know, the identity divides actually cause people to override their objective economic and political preferences. So they will forgive transgressions by their identity leaders of their objective political and social preferences and point the finger at the opposite party. So you see that in the United States where you have Democrats and Republicans pointing the finger of corruption at the other side and each party being very unwilling to shine a spotlight on its own transgression of ethical principles, right? And I would even say the current protests about police mistreatment of non-white people, of black people and people of color, you know, it's really interesting because that can be seen as a particularly egregious subset of the kleptocratic network's instrumentalization of identity divides, right? I mean, it has been a case in the United States that waving race card has been an incredibly effective way of getting poor white people to side with rich white people on behalf of policies that objectively harm to a huge degree poor white people, be they poor white, basically indentured farmers, essentially that's how agriculture worked, then and now. I mean, you have farming families that are effectively indentured to gigantic corporations like Purdue and Monsanto and things like that, who are being excruciatingly exploited by those companies, but will still vote on behalf of those companies against parties that are seen as more friendly to black people. So the whole racist card is a way of dividing the, the impoverished in America across the identity divides. But the problem is that you have people of color who are exclusively focused on the racism issue and are not noticing that trillions of dollars are being poured into the speculative financial industry. You know, and these are COVID relief funds that ought to be being spent on their communities. So when they talk about defunding or reimagining the police, what's not on their mind is hundreds of billions of dollars today that are being spent in the stock market that ought to be redirected toward the population and in particular the disadvantaged population. And that means in this country, the population of color. So that's how the kleptocratic network stays in power, because you are not hearing any Democrats in Congress raising their voices against this spending by the Federal Reserve on the stock market. You'll hear them making lots of token statements about and even relatively more consequential efforts with respect to the police. But the police is the low hanging fruit here. Police as terribly as they consistently behave in this country, you can call the police, in a sense, a formal instrument of force in the hands of the kleptocratic networks, right? That's kind of what they're doing, is helping to police the property of kleptocratic networks. Well, you know, you get enough pressure to reform the police, Ah, you can get a little bit of low-level reform, just as there was eventually some serious reform of the police in the country of Georgia. And that was a significant reform. I don't want to diminish that. However, kleptocratic networks are very much still in control of the country of Georgia. And I suspect that this is kind of another way of understanding kleptocratic networks is to think of them as a hydra, that Greek mythical beast that every time you cut off a head, two more would sprout. So let's take a look at Egypt. The Mubarak head of Egypt's kleptocratic network was struck off in 2011. And what do you know? Sisi sprouted. Well, I am tempted to say that the American Hydra is suddenly offering up the police as a head to strike off, or at least to wound, in order for the rest of its heads to go untouched. <laughs>
the way you describe it, it feels almost Machiavellian. This idea of like inflaming something that you know captures people's emotions, and then at the same time, under the desk, you're busy doing something completely different that's against the interests of everyone, but no one's paying attention. One hundred percent. People's attention is being distracted by a very visceral issue. Homo sapiens is hardwired to create in groups and out groups. It has also remarkably created an ethos of egalitarianism. Homo sapiens is the most egalitarian or was the most egalitarian of primates. And it did that by very consciously policing for tens of thousands of years an egalitarian social structure because that was the way it could hunt, that's the way our forebears could hunt big game. And so we evolved to be much more egalitarian than chimpanzees are, for example. However, once we settled down, we still had that hierarchical trait in our DNA, you know, that primate hierarchical tendency. And that is exactly what these kleptocratic networks seek to do, is to reactivate the hierarchical tendencies that are in our makeup, and they do it by creating and exacerbating in-group dominance and in-group affiliations and jealousies. And it's unbelievably effective. It's incredibly effective. And until we, the egalitarian coalition, can bring ourselves to overcome those knee-jerk identitarian loyalties, be it to race, be it to gender, be it to sexual orientation, be it to political orientation, we are going to keep losing. There's some other really interesting social science research, which I highlight in my forthcoming book on corruption in America, which has to do with the impact of widespread disaster. Interestingly, calamity, if it is broadly shared, has an egalitarian impact or an equalizing. It has a broadly equalizing impact, which allows and promotes the egalitarian ethos to rise above our class and identity uh, divisions and barriers. And you always see it in in earthquakes, in floods, in the Great Depression, in World War II in the United Kingdom, in World War I across Europe. The egalitarian tendencies take precedence. What's fascinating about COVID is it's been one of the rare types of disaster that actually drives people apart. People cannot be together. They can't eat together. They can't physically share their resources. You still see a lot of it. You see a lot of solidarity, even crossing the physical distances during this COVID pandemic. But this particular crisis has been especially beneficial to the kleptocratic networks who themselves are always focused on how to profit from crisis. Kleptocratic networks include a remarkable number of vulture capitalists, you know, who snap up distressed resources and distressed people, frankly. That, again, is the personnel that holds a disproportionate membership in the Trump administration. So given the situation that you've described in the US at the moment, is the US system suited to actually deal with these abuses of power? Not currently, no. I think we have seen how incredibly vulnerable our institutions have been to capture by the kleptocratic elites. So what you see, for example, is a 2007 tax overhaul bill, tax overhaul law, which disproportionately favored the very richest members of the American population. There was almost no dissent from Democrats. Too many of them, frankly, are members of that world or its sort of immediate orbit. You see the CARES COVID Relief Act 
you know, sail through Congress without really any significant oversight over how the Federal Reserve will be purchasing securities. You see an impeachment process, a subpoena process that was simply gutted by the President of the United States, who essentially stated and was able to impose the fact that he is immune to any and all oversight from the supposed co-equal branch of government that is the United States Congress. You see a United States Senate that is held in the hand of one individual, its majority leader, Mitch McConnell. It is held in his grip because he controls the purse strings. He controls the campaign fund for Senate races. You now have a U.S. campaign system that is completely dominated by money. Mitch McConnell has very cleverly captured the source of supply for money to run for Senate for Republicans. Therefore, whatever he wants, he gets. And what he has done is essentially castrate the United States Senate. So it's not just that nobody would even dare vote to call witnesses in what was supposed to be an impeachment trial against President Trump. But not only that, he simply refuses to bring any bills up for a vote. The only bills, you know, draft laws that are brought up before the Senate for a vote are the appointments of conservative judicial nominees and other Trump administration appointees. And the CARES Act relief bills, which provided undue revenue streams to private sector members of the network. And so you have a United States Senate that is as disabled as any legislature in any autocracy in the world, period. That's the situation we are in in the United States. And so with that being said, what can be done to combat this now? A really determined effort by American voters to overcome the objective power of money in politics. I must say I am personally disappointed by the Democratic presidential candidate because he is pretty intertwined with these networks. He comes from the state of Delaware and has spent much of his political career you know, protecting Delaware as a secrecy jurisdiction where it services organized crime and corrupt networks around the world. So I'm unhappy at that presidential candidate, but that means that people who on the right and the left who are serious about restoring a minimum of integrity to American politics must demand an end to this type of interchanging personnel between significant private sectors. And that means energy in particular, and it means Wall Street. And it frankly means the construction and real estate industry. Those connections must be severed. There needs to be a significant stiffening of ethical legislation, the, you know, what used to be norms in this country need to be transformed into hard-edged laws. We must demand, as we're demanding the reimagination, the reimagining of our police and criminal justice sector, we must refund and re-staff our white-collar crime and corruption, corporate crime and corruption, both detectives, investigation within police at local, state, and national levels, and then also prosecution. That whole apparatus needs to be significantly reinforced, and it has to become sexy. You know, I have a friend who helped launch the first banking fraud unit in a U.S. attorney's office, or sorry, in her U.S. attorney's office in um, Kansas City, Missouri. And this was in the early 1990s when there were still a lot of serious prosecutions happening, you know, within banking fraud from the savings and loan crisis of the 1980s and 90s. And then suddenly that became less fashionable and it became healthcare fraud. Individual people and doctors who were cheating the healthcare system, you know, Medicare and Medicaid, that became a sexy thing. Wow. 
you know, frankly, the financial services industry prepared the bubble and collapse of 2008. No, all of our best prosecutors shifted to healthcare fraud. And then the incentive structure was shifted to terrorism. And so all of the most dynamic, effective, brilliant prosecutors started, you know, clamoring to get on the terrorism unit. We need to make corporate crime and corruption the sexiest job for police, FBI, and public prosecutors. And that is going to require voting different people into office. So none of this can happen under a Trump administration or under a number of the kind of kleptocratic network funded administrations in a lot of Republican states, but I have to tell you the mainstream Democratic Party is also guilty. So this is not a blue versus red thing. This is a thing where political leaders across the political spectrum have got to get their feet held to the fire, just like their feet are being held to the fire on issues of racial injustice today. We've got to turn the same level of adamant determination onto the broader issue of integrity in our government and economic systems. And that's all we've got time for in this bonus episode of The Impact, Coronavirus and Organised Crime from the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organised Crime. Thank you very much to Sarah for allowing me to speak to her for so long. Remember that you can find out more about transnational organised crime by visiting the GI's website www.globalinitiative.net. We'll be back again soon with a special episode focusing solely on Brazil. I'm Jack Megan Vickers. We'll talk to you soon. During the 21st century, thousands of criminal assassinations have occurred worldwide. They produce a butterfly effect of trauma locally, nationally, regionally and globally. Despite these efforts to silence, criminal assassinations can be a source of hope and community resilience. He had a fire in him. He couldn't stand corruption, and he wouldn't stop after exposing it. She was such a force of nature that when I first met her, I came away a bit shaken, a bit intimidated. He was a very pleasant, modest and humble person who dreamt about a time when all criminals would pay for their deeds. She taught us the fear paralyzed actions of the people. We will never give up, even if we got killed, even if they murder us. They didn't, didn't die. die. They multiplied. Thousands of brave souls have paid with their lives because they refused to tolerate criminal governance. In 2019, the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organised Crime commissioned approximately 50 profiles of persons assassinated across the world under the Faces of Assassination project. These profiles highlight places where organised crime has permeated political, cultural and economic sectors of society. Check out our website and join the campaign.